Welcome to the start of week three, P. Kemmer. So uh, we're going to look at the decay of excited states. So we uh, dump energy into a molecule. So normally we shine light on a molecule and it absorbs that energy and creates an excited state. And the question is, what happens to those excited states? So uh, where do they go? Or rather, how do they evolve over time? So we can start by drawing an energy diagram. And uh, we're going to go ahead and draw the, uh, the grand uh, electronic state uh, down here. We're going to call this S0. We'll describe what that means in a minute. And uh, those are electronic states. So the vibrational states are kind of superimposed on top. And uh, the vibrational spacing is much smaller than the electronic spacing. And uh, here's the uh, first excited state, S1. So we're going to describe our ground state as S0. And our excited states, we're going to label with 1s and 2s and 3s. And uh, so this is S1. And again, it's an electronic state. So we're going to go ahead and draw in the vibrational energy levels over top. And again, the vibrational energy levels are much smaller than the electronic energy levels. So there is a big gap between these electronic states. But these vibrational states are pretty close together. Okay, so uh, what the S stands for is singlet. And so the S represents uh, singlet states. And uh, they are also, off to the side, uh, what we call triplet states. And we're going to use T for triplet. And so the triplet states are going to look something like this. It turns out the first excited triplet state is T1. And it's normally below that of the first excited singlet state. So that's an important distinction we'll come back to here in a moment. And again, they've got vibrational levels. It's going to look something like this. And these kind of diagrams are typically referred to as Jablonski diagrams, so Jablonski uh, diagrams. So we're kind of um, neglecting some of the detail, but we're really just focusing on the energy levels themselves. So we got S for our triplet states, and we got T for our triplet states. So, uh, so what do we mean by singlet and triplet? So what do we mean by singlet or triplet? These are actually what we refer to technically as the spin multiplicities. So uh, you may remember multiplicities from NMR and organic. So this is kind of a similar kind of idea. And very, very roughly, we'll see this isn't exactly true, but roughly you can think of this as the number of unpaired electrons plus one. And uh, if you've set up any calculations in uh, Spartan or Hypercam, sometimes it'll ask you for the spin multiplicity. And so you can roughly take it as the number of unpaired electrons plus one. So if you've got a singlet, Okay, so that is equivalent to 1 or versus a triplet, which is equivalent to 3. Then uh, very roughly, you can see a singlet corresponds to 0 unpaired electrons. And uh, a triplet would correspond to 2 unpaired electrons. So the idea is normally that the electrons are all paired up. So you've got as many up as down, and that would be a singlet state. And if you take one of those unpaired electrons, or rather one of those paired electrons, and flip the spin, then all of a sudden you have two electrons with parallel spin. And so since there's two unpaired electrons, we call that a triplet state. So let's look at this in a little more detail. So we're going to have to really focus on, on angular momentum. So uh, we said a singlet is essentially a situation where we have zero unpaired electrons. And so we've got our electrons that look something like this. Uh, we know that the electron spin quantum number, m sub s, right, is plus a half if it's up or minus a half if it's down. So we've got two electrons here. And uh, we're just going to say the first one is plus a half, maybe, and the second one is minus a half. Um, we can talk about the molecule's overall um, spin quantum number, and that's just the sum of all the individual uh, electron spin quantum numbers. So we can see as soon as we have as many ups and downs, we're essentially going to be adding, you know, positive one halves to minus one halves uh, forever. You know, how many orbitals you've got full, and we can see, of course, that's going to be zero. So where does that get us? Well, um, it turns out that if you've got um, a magnetic spin quantum number, it must come from a, a spin quantum number S. And we know that S um, has a value, whatever it may be, and M sub S can take values from minus S all the way out to positive S. So uh, if we've got M sub S of zero, that implies that our overall molecule spin quantum number must be zero, because that's the only way you can generate that one value. Now, however, if you go to a, a situation where you've got two unpaired electrons, 
and we look at the spin quantum numbers here for each electron. We've got positive one half for this one, positive one half for this one. That gives us an overall spin quantum number, a magnetic spin quantum number of positive one. And again, we ask ourselves, where does this come from? There is a total spin quantum number, S, and we know that M sub S takes values from minus S all the way out to plus s. So if m sub s is positive 1, that implies that s itself should probably have uh, a value of positive 1. Spin angular momentum must behave just like regular orbital angular momentum. Uh, we've got uh, the vector s, I suppose. That is our spin angular momentum. We've met before these angular momentum vectors tend to lay on the surface of a cone. Uh, we've met some equations. We know that the uh, square length of the vector uh, must be equal to some spin quantum number plus uh, 1 times by itself times by h bar squared and we also know that the z component of this angular momentum vector must be equal to some uh, magnetic quantum number times by h bar and we've seen before that m sub s uh, this magnetic this uh, essentially the z component quantum number must take values from minus s all the way out to plus s and i won't go through zero because if you've got a fractional uh, spin quantum number like uh, a spin quantum number of three halves that would mean it would take values from you know minus three halves minus one half positive one half to positive three halves but if it's integer then it will go through zero so uh, this is what we've got so far so for our triplet state okay so our triplet state okay which we've said roughly is equal to you know two unpaired electrons uh, more properly right we can say there's actually three states here so what do we have we have got s equals one and we've got uh, m sub s is equal to minus one zero or plus one so we might investigate what this means so if s is one that implies that the uh, the squared length of this spin angular momentum uh, must be equal to one times by one plus one uh, times by h bar squared so that's two h bar squared uh, we can then say, if you like, that the length of the spin quantum number here must be root 2 h bar. And then if we focus in on the z component term here, so we can see that s sub z is equal to uh, m sub s times h bar. Uh, so that means it's equal to either minus h bar, uh, 0, or positive h bar. So we know two things here. We know that the angular momentum length is uh, root 2 h bar and we know that the z component is either minus h bar zero or h bar so again that gives us our sort of our cone model here and we can investigate this on the next slide okay so for the triplet state we know that the length of the spin vector is equal to root 2 h bar and we know that the z component is either minus h bar or zero or positive h bar so sort of our semi-classical interpretation is that the spin angular momentum vector is processing around a cone and uh, we've got three possible um, cones going on here so uh, we've either got uh, one that's pointing in the upward direction so if we take this to be our z axis and uh, our z component then would be positive h bar here zero and minus h bar here so we know that, that that is possible if the angular momentum sits on the surface of a cone we can do some trigonometry and figure out the angle of the cone but we can see that the total length right uh, is going to be root 2 h bar and the z component is h bar and this angular momentum vector has got to process somewhere on the surface of this now if we look at m sub s equals zero that gives us a z projection of zero and it gives us still a total length of root 2 h bar so I suppose it's processing on the surface of a flattened cone or a disk or probably a circle actually in this case. And if we look at the third projection here, so if m sub s is minus 1, that gives us a z component of minus h bar and again a total length of root 2 h bar. So that means that our total um, spin um, angular momentum must uh, process on the surface of a cone pointing in the downward direction so since we've got three different states here um, so uh, three different orientations of the spin angular momentum that's why this is referred to as a triplet state and uh, we might have said uh, way back when right that this corresponds to two unpaired electrons and so uh, how can this be possible um, there's only uh, presumably uh, two ways you can do it right they can both be paired like that 
or they can be both paired like that. So uh, what is this third possibility, right? Well, presumably one has to be up and one has to be down. So how can that possibly be a triplet state? And we can look at the individual electrons angular momentum. And again, when we draw that up arrow, we're really just saying that that spin angular momentum vector is laying uh, generally in a positive z direction. So uh, we've got our two ones that are up. They look something like that. Uh, we can sum those together. And if we sum those together, we can see that the overall z length is going to double and uh, the um, it's going to project on the surface of a cone something like that and so if they're in phase and they're both pointing to the right and then sometime later they're both pointing to the left then you would get sort of this total um, vector looking something like that and if we look at the two down ones so again when we draw um, a down one uh, we're not saying that it's exactly down we're just saying that it's got a z projection uh, in the negative direction. So uh, we can go ahead and we can say that this first down one is going to look something like this and the second down electron is also going to look something like this and again we're pointing those angular momentum vectors sort of in the uh, in the four o'clock position I suppose and when we add these up again the z components add up so we get something that's twice as long and uh, if they're in phase and they're sort of both pointing to the right or both pointing to the left at the same time we'll have our second state and so we can kind of identify this one here with this guy up here and this one here is this one here so what about this one here uh, what is going on here so we've said we've got one up and we've got one down so uh, ooh, let's try and uh, be consistent with our pen color here so we've got one up so here's our cone and uh, our spin angular momentum we're going to process along the surface of a cone something like that here's our second one that's down uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to keep it sort of uh, down to the right whenever the other one is up and to the right and so you can imagine when you add those two together Okay, the vertical component is gone, so the z components exactly uh, cancel out. Uh, but because they're both pointing to the right, um, as they process around, and as long as they keep in phase with one another, as they process around, you know, when they're both to the right, this will give us a, a length to the right here in the overall one. And it's sometime later, if they're both to the left, then those would give us one that's pointing all the way to the left. So the x, y components don't cancel out because they're sort of spinning in phase with each other. And so because they don't cancel out, they reinforce and they give us this third state here. So uh, we'll see for the singlet state that it just means that when one is pointing to the right, the other one is pointing to the left. And then you get absolutely zero um, overall when you add them together. So as promised, here's the singlet state. So we said before the singlet state corresponds roughly to no unpaired electrons and uh, so that means that our electrons whether in the same orbital or not it doesn't matter too much but one is up and one is down so we've seen before that s is zero and uh, m sub s is zero so that implies that the total square length is zero times by zero plus one and you can see where this is going this is just zero so the total length is zero and we can see that the z component is uh, m sub s times by h bar so again it's going to be zero as well so how do you have two electrons uh, that give you uh, give you this kind of situation so clearly the vector itself right doesn't have any length at all so it could just be a dot so here we go so we're going to stick to our cone model so our first electron uh, we are going to go ahead and have it pointing up which just means it's got a z component that's positive and the second one we're going to point down uh, but here is the trick so we are going to keep it out of phase so what that means is that as the first electron that's pointing up is pointing to the right the uh, second one as it's pointing down it's pointing to the left and vice versa so as this one goes left to right this one's going right to left so their x y motion is uh, correlated perfectly and so when you add them up it actually just all cancels out so when you add these together basically you just get a big fat null length vector and there's only one of them so hence it's a singlet state